I'd like to welcome you all to this lecture, which is in memory of a much loved and much missed member of the society, Ian Robertson. Without further ado, I shall pass you on to David Kidd, who is going to talk about an incident that has such gravity, especially in this area and also in the Pilots Church. David. So, why does camera and action not necessarily in that order? Now, it is my privilege to give this talk in memory of my good friend Ian. Uh, everybody who knew Ian will know him as an enthusiastic and likable character. I just told Anne that I thought Ian had set sheets through the middle of him like a stick of rock from the top to the bottom. Uh, Ian was an enthusiast for all things sections, for maritime, mining, and local history in general. He only had, to my mind, one fault, is that for some unknown reason, he supported the football team that played in black and white. Instead, following the true fear, which of course is Sessions FC, the Marlins, who I've supported since I was over at that time. Uh, I was involved in many, many research projects with him. The one that could have ended up most dramatic, in which I think could have got us to the national news, was when we were working with uh, Bean's World, looking for the body of uh, William Jobling, who was executed for the murder of Nicholas Fairless. And uh, I researched the documents and found an account from Jobling's wife taken in Hart Workhouse describing how his body was taken down from the gibbet of Town Dock and secretly buried in Jowl King Cove. So the body was encased in an iron frame. Ian had the equipment to look at it. We had the GPS. So Bean's world were very keen. So we went and had a look. And we thought, this is the local version of Richard III. We will be on the national news. But unfortunately, when we got there, just in the place where we thought the body might be, there was an open green pile. And so we didn't get a chance to look. But when you see the massive pile that goes across the river in Jarrow, Jogging to the Now, uh, I should give apologies for the president of the society, uh, Katrina Portis, who would have loved to have been here, but unfortunately, given the state of the uh, COVID epidemic, uh, she is the principal carer for a teenaging parents and she is isolating and shielding. But she's got a very close family connection to the Providence. Uh, Katrina's, I think it's five times great grandfather, I'm not sure exactly how far it goes back. But Katrina's great 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 grandfather, who's Lancelot Byrne, Cox and the Providence. And so, Katrina sends her best wishes, and again, she has a very personal connection with this, with this tragedy, and with this church. So, if you use the devilish thing, a 
computer, instead of looking at real books and actual records, and search Google for life world disasters. Wikipedia will give you a list of life world disasters. It's not a complete list, and there's one missing. The losses of the providence was more than any other life world disaster on that list. The reason it's not on the list is because the providence wasn't an order on the life board, and the narrative of the disaster of providence doesn't fit into the normal history as I'm going to tell you. But the providence played a massive role in the development of life and in the development of the world. And it was a particular tragedy where 20 of the crew of the Providence drowned within sight of the families in broad daylight not too far from the shore. It was a traumatic experience, a traumatic incident, which devastated the community of Sashis, the close-knit pilot community of Sashis. And they were all members of this church. So it's appropriate that I'm talking here in their memory as well. Now, the Providence disaster took place on the morning of the 4th of December, which was a Tuesday, 1849. The beginning of December that year was a succession of gales. I think we're all familiar with what that looks like. On the morning of the 4th, there was a squally easterly wind blowing into the river. And at about a quarter past nine in the morning, a tug was towing a brig, the Betsy, laden with salt into the river. They let go of the tow rope a bit to give the brig more slack as they were coming in through the seas. And the brig drifted along the extreme point of hard sand. The tide at the time was about an hour and a half past high tide. And it was flowing at three, the ebb tide was flowing at three knots out the river. The stranding of the Betsy was seen by pilots who were watching from the pilots' watch house on the road. The number one boat at South Shields in Providence was launched within minutes of the ship striking. At first, there were 29 people in the crew. The Providence had 14 oars. She was the largest lifeboat in the uh, Time Lifeboat Society fleet. And her normal crew would have been 16 or 18. The coxswain kicked out five of the people who wanted to be in the crew. So five of the 29 who boarded were asked to leave. They kept some of the others to double man some of the oars because they had to take the boat down the river from the double boat house down there to Corbel Landing, out down the river and along the end of Fort Sand, against the wind, and particularly through a very choppy uh, scene with the wind against tide. So Providence went out, and the Betsy was stuck on the end of Fort Sand with the tide ebbing fast, the Betsy had swung round 
So by the time the providence reached there, the Betsy was bowels pointing out to sea. And the providence came alongside. If you imagine, this is the Betsy with a bow pointing out to sea. Providence came alongside. They managed to get alongside in the second attempt. The first attempt, they wanted to put a bow line and a stern line on the Betsy. The Betsy didn't have the ropes ready, so the Providence had to circle around and come back again. They went alongside. On the near side, the oars were shipped. On the far side, the oars were out holding the boat into the side of the bed. In the evidence given to the inquest, there's some dispute as to whether the providence bow or stern was against the Betsy's bow stern. But if you know she's like that, the bow of the stern was exactly the same. So the misunderstanding is of the problems. What happened the second time they went alongside was they got the lines from the Betsy, put them on the bow of the stern of the Providence, and just as they'd done that, and they were telling the crew to come on board the lifeboat, a big sea came round the bow of the Betsy. Either the line at the bow of the Betsy wasn't fastened properly or it was broken and the providence swung around. As it swung around it tilted the oars and all of the things fell over on that side. They were caught by the end tide which was running in three months and the boat turned over. The boat turned over and because it was the design of life it was an extremely stable board, unsinkable, but once it was upside down, it would not work. The ballast was essentially an open well in the bottom of the board. So the bottom of the board had an open well which was full of water. And that kept the board stable. When it turned upside down, it all around, so it floated upside down. Three men managed to cling on to the bottom of the providence. One man managed to jump on board the Betsy. The rest disappeared into the sea under the boat. Once that was seen, the number 10 machine's boat at the time was launched from the lifeboat house at Corbin Landing and it took off the three men who were on the upturned one of the province. The lifeboat Northumberland was launched from Tidemouth and it took off the crew of the Betsy plus the one man who commands to get on the Betsy. The providence drifted down the coast and came ashore near Trowlocks on the beach. There was a big rush of people from here down to Trial Rocks because the idea was that some of the crew might be underneath the internal board. It took them five attempts to get the board upright. And when they got the board upright, there was no way. I think you can imagine the scene on the beach. The scene of the people whose husbands and fathers had survived and those who had been lost. Also, the scene of the five men who might have been in the crew and who were killed off. Now, with the disaster, 
was in the box. Only one body was found immediately after the disaster. That was the body of the coxswain, Lancelot Burn. So the inquest was held on the body of Lancelot Burn at a public house, Salmon's house in South Shields. And the general verdict was that Lancelot Burn died because of the upsetting of the boat due to the sea. But there was a caveat on that, which was taken by the Shields Gazette. Because if anything happens in South Shields which is gone wrong, it must be the fault of the Corporation of Newcastle. And at the time, the Corporation of Newcastle, who at that time controlled the navigation of the time, were doing trial boards for building the piers at the entrance. And there were two posts on the sides. There's a dispute of how far they were from the bed. It varies between 20 yards and 100 yards, depending on who, which version you believe. But the inquest jury mentioned that the posts had impeded the approach of the lifeboat, and the Shields Gazette, being having its ear to local opinion, blamed the Corporation of Newcastle for putting these posts and uh, creating hazards to the navigation of pilots and lifeboats. Uh, I don't honestly think that's a convincing explanation. Now, the Providence disaster had an impact far beyond the pilot community and far beyond the local people of South Shields. The reason for that is that even before the disaster, there was a general feeling that there was something wrong with the life There had been an incident in 1840 with the type of the life of the world where it only just managed to reach shore and the crew were convinced it was going to capsize. Uh, the incident led to the Tiger Lifeboat Society offering a prize of £10 for the design of an improved life. The prize was won by a local sanctions man, George Farrell. George Farrell was one of the people I'm going to highlight in this, in this talk. He was a local man from Sanctions, lived in my road. He might have gone to this church, he might have gone to St. Hilda's, I don't know. What I do know is that he was Henry Greathead's youngest apprentice, working on the famous set of life pools that Greathead built. And George Farrow's invention was water ballast, sealed in a tank, which made Farrow's life pool self writing So George Farrow won 10 pounds, for his design, but the lifeboat was never built. Now, following the Providence disaster, Trinity House of Newcastle organised another competition, a local competition where they offered a prize of £30 for the best design of life. George Farrell entered the design an improved version of his original lifeboat from 1841 and 
Romans 30 pound. The key thing about the providence wasn't the local competition, it was the national competition. In 1850, the Royal National, the National, sorry, Life Board Institution, which had been founded in 1824, was more or less more important. The institution was running short of funds. It was felt that the lifeboats around the coast were unserviceable and unsuitable. Many of the lifeboats built in the boom following the great heads grant from Parliament were rotting in their houses and hadn't been used because they were heavy, because they needed large crews, and because they were only suitable for very short distances. So, the Duke of Northumberland offered a prize for an improved design of a lifeboat, and the prize was £100. A lot of money. Now, the report of the competition committee is a fantastic document. If anybody is interested in local history, they actually have a copy in the Little Fin in Newcastle. And it's a wonderful document, and not only it gives you the assessment of all of the designs, that was 280 designs submitted models. It not only gives you that, it gives you an assessment of all of the lifeboats stationed around the coast of Britain. What condition you are in, whether it was serviceable. So it really is the founding document of the order line as we know it. Now the committee had a number of criteria on what should be a good lifeboat. It's interesting that they are more or less drawn from the principles that were written out by William Hales, who was a pamphleteer and collaborator with Willie Woodhouse, in making the case for Willie Woodhouse being the inventor of the lifeboat. Hales described exactly what a lifeboat should be like. The committee more or less echoed. So the characteristics of the life of the world was it should be unsinkable. It should be a singularly boat growing in heavy seas. It should also be a singularly boat sailing. It should also be self writing It should also be able to clear, see out of the boat to increase its stability. It should have a large carrying capacity and it should be resistant to damage. The committee gave all of these things a score. George Farrell entered. He came sixth. The reason he came sixth is his boat, which was a classic Shields life boat, with the curved keel, was self riding, but he was sailor. So he lost 18 marks because he was sailor. The winner was a man called Beecher from Great Yarmouth. He designed what later became the RNLI National Lifeboat. And it's the one that you will have all seen where it's got high ends, it's a relatively narrow boat, it's got masts, it rows and it sails. And the origins of that National Lifeboat is 
from the providence and from the, the competition that came out from the providence. I would go so far as to say that that lifeboat saved the RNLI because the Motherboard organization changed from being something which struggled to raise funds to something which could put a lifeboat in small communities all around the coast and they could put a lifeboat which didn't need a crew of experienced pilots to take it out and it could go out to the long distances to the wreck. So that's the significance of the problems. And it's a great pity that it's not well known. The Providence is actually on the Wall of Honor at the headquarters of the RNLI in Poole. But in the general document, it's not there. Which I said is a shame. Now, you might want to say, why is it not better known than shields? Now, we've got here this very holy and moving memorial to the lost crew of the Providence. It was put up here in 1896, 45 years after the Providence was lost. When that was put up, the Shields Gazette said the delay in putting that up was a matter of eternal shame to the people of South Shields. And the reason for this delay was there was a different narrative about lifeboats in South Shields. Lifeboats had become part of the identity of the new town of South Shields. They put the lifeboat on the back on the back of the town. They built the Woodhaven Great Air Memorial, properly known as the Jubilee Clock Tower, although I don't think anybody in Shields knows it as that. They built that and they have invested a lot of this the identity of the town, in particular the story of the new town, the inventor of the life of the world. Now there's a, a paradox in identifying Buddha as the inventor of the life of the world. The reason is, is that Buddha had built a model he, with Hales, established the principles of the self-writing road. According to Hales, he took his model down to the beach in South Shields and tested it in the surf. And Hales put out a story that he got his idea from what you like in a Kogan to us or a bit of melon floating in a bucket or a bit of a broken bowl. The only problem with those stories is none of the shoes left were to self writing. None of them had any connection with the design principles that would have been here as established. The National Life Board certainly did have, but none of the earlier life boards did. Now there is a reason for that. The Shields Life Boards, as I think everybody agreed here, were brilliant boards. In my view, the Providence capsized because of the bad luck. The chance that that road was not properly made, the circumstances meant that the boat was in the worst possible place at the worst possible time. It had already come out of the river, out from the river, and up around the end of the sand in terrible conditions. 
the deputy coxswain of the Providence who survived the disaster took the Providence out in the worst gale on the northeast coast three weeks after the disaster. There was no shortage of volunteers and there was no lack of confidence in the board. As a surfboard, she's lifeboards were unsurpassed. And they didn't need to be self-writing because handled the problem, except in extreme bad luck, they wouldn't capsize. But what they couldn't do was go any distance. If there was a wreck a long way from the coast, the Shane's lifeboat was towed out by a tug. Now, that's okay on the river like the time, but it's not possible in other places. Hence, these boats will only suit a particular places. The RNR put their new national lifeboat into places around the coast. In some places, the fishermen who manned the boats then hated the national lifeboat. The reason they did was it was narrow, and because it was self like it was also liable to capsize. So, the fishermen of Bridlington, the fishermen of Cromer, had their own lifeboats built to the design of the traditional seals lifeboat because their role of their boats was to go off an open beach through the surf and take people off a wreck close to shore. But in other places where you had to sail long distances, the Shields lifeboat, unless you had a tow which would tow it out, you couldn't get there. Now, I want to come back to Mr. Fowler. Mr. Fowler built the only self-writing shoes on board. It was launched from Adam House in July 1857. It was built to order, not to the Time Lifeboard Institution, but to a group of sailors who wanted to establish a business, salvage business. And they wanted a boat that was safe and quick to launch. The lifeboat he built was called the James Mayer. And for a period in the 1850s, the James Mayer was the first one to get to many wrecks. The reason it was the first one, it was kept afloat because it was self-draining with water ballast tanks so it would handle the right of float. There was no need for people to pull it out and launch it. And the, uh, the crew who had a choice, there were lots of pilots who were ready to crew lifeboats. If they crewed the Time Lifeboat Society, they would get 10 shoes and six and from the 1840s, the Time Lifeboat Society prohibited the crews from claiming salvage. What happened was shipowners using the time would subscribe to the lifeboat. On the James Mather, the James Mather would rescue the sailors. But then they would claim salvage on the ship. And the salvage on the ship would go to the crew. So in a number of instances, the James Mayer then was first. And like I said, it was self lighting It was the only issue with life board of its time. It's almost unknown in the time. But if you go to the South Shields Museum, there is a picture. 
because John Scott painted the opening of Time Dock and there was one lifeboat in the parade for the opening of Time Dock. It was the James Bailey. And in the middle of this picture is a lifeboat. So that's the James Bailey. So Mr. Farrell's principles did work. It's rather a shame what happened to him because he, uh, he kept all his models until he, he was in extreme old age. They were all sold to support him and he died in one of the workhouse penniless. But <coughs> as, a, as a local hero who gathers together all the history of life points and such things, I think he's a man who deserves to be remembered. Now, linking with that plaque, I should also mention the Providence. Because what happened to the Providence? Well, the Providence was undamaged after the disaster, it was recovered from dry rocks, went immediately back into service. Uh, the air cases in it were reported as being having a small amount of water and they were largely intact. It had continued in service in the lifeboat until 1872 when it was sold out of service. And it was sold to a man called Mr. Purvis, which I think on the right up here, Mr. Purvis is a very, very uh, important name. I suspect Mr. Purvis was a member of the crew. And Mr. Purvis used the uh, used the Providence as a silent word, in the same way as the James Miller. Now, when that plaque, when that plaque was put in, the Providence was still in existence. Uh, the last reference I have to the Providence was she was being used as a water boat on the river. She'd been decked over and had an engine put in. And in 1896, the Providence was sitting on the wood, a tiny dock basin, sunk. And that's the last reference. There was a short lived campaign saying, in view of the history of this board, why don't we try and save it? But nobody did, which is a great, great pity. Because you have a board which is emblematic of the community on the lower top here. And also played such a prominent role in the development of life forms. It also comes back to uh, one of the reasons I wanted this talk in memory of Ian. Ian was a very practical historian. Ian's method was there's a rude mind shaft, let's go and look for it. There's such and such, let's go and see. And one of the things we were going to do was to look for the providence. To search out, was there anything in the, in the records which said where the providence is? And then if it was there, if it's fallen a bit in bits of the wood, maybe it's still there. Maybe it still is. The place where it was last recorded was near Redhead's Land. And it's just where the port type authority is infilled the whole lot. So if it's still there, it's under a load of rubble and inaccessible. But I would like to think that if any board represents the traditions 
of the law here, the traditions of the pilots who were the congregation of this church, it's the providence. The courage and the signature and the design that went into it. I also want to add as a conclusion there's a load of debate. Who invented the life of it? Some people say it was William Woodhouse. Some people say it was Henry Greta. I think there was something much more important invented here. Where the spirit comes from this church and this community on the road. And that is the tradition of the lifeboat. The tradition of the lifeboat which is manned by volunteers, which does not claim salvage, and which goes out to rescue people, to save lives. That service has its origins here. That's what the people she has invented. And that's what we should be proud of. So, thank you.